I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, third in the series of uh, winter lectures on, uh, from the 50th celebration of the, uh, the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. My name is Mike Finlay, I'm the Professor of Oncology. And on behalf of uh, John Luth, the CEO of the Cancer Society Auckland and Northland, I'd like, you to, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's uh, um, lectures. I'm sure you'll find them most entertaining and informing. Um, we, uh, we have a couple of housekeeping rules. One is I've left my mobile phone out to remind me, to remind you to switch your mobile phone on to silent. So you can see I've done mine. Um, the second is that if there's an emergency, there are exits to, to use. If uh, one needs the bathroom, the bathrooms are up outside the lecture theatre. And so with that done, I'd like to uh, firstly introduce the, uh, the, the director, Sue Brewster, executive director of the Auckland Medical Research Foundation, who along with the Cancer Society uh, of Auckland and Northland and the Medical Health Sciences are the, the co-sponsors of this session. So Sue, would you like to come forward? Thank you very much, and what a fantastic turnout there is here tonight. Even on a rainy night, we couldn't put anyone off, and it's just wonderful to see you all here, so thank you very much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be partnering with the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences and the Cancer Society for this particular lecture um, and in celebration of the 50th anniversary. So look, I don't think there's, um, I'm just going to do the buttons, I don't think there's too much that I can actually say about funding research into cancer treatments um, because I think this young lady, Kiriana's story, will really say it all. So in March 2015, Kiriana Elliott woke up with a bit of a sore ankle, feeling a bit tired, not her usual buzzy self. And then one month later, she was diagnosed with leukaemia. Kiriana's mum, Ursula, described that day as the worst day in their family's lives. But the good news is that prior to Kiriana's diagnosis, Dr. Andrew Wood, a paediatrician specialising in child blood cancers, was awarded our AMRF Douglas Goodfellow Repatriation Fellowship. And we brought him back from Philadelphia, where he was working. This funding allowed Dr Wood to return home and advance his research into childhood leukaemia. And he also was Kiriana's specialist, caring for her during her cancer care and her treatments. So then we fast forward to May 2017, and Kiriana's treatments had all finished, and she was allowed to return home to her family. Tonight, I'm so delighted to say that Kiriana is in full remission. She's back to playing hockey and netball and doing dancing that she absolutely loves. And of course, Kiriana and her family are so grateful to Dr Wood and his team for the extraordinary care that they received during that journey. But I think the big thing they also acknowledge is that without funding into research for the cancer treatments, Kiriana's outcomes could have been very, very different. So I'd like to finish by thanking our incredible presenters who are here tonight and uh, presenting on behalf of our research community who are all working to provide advancement in medicine and health. Um, but most of all, I'd like to thank our supporters who are here tonight because without your support, a bright and healthy future for children like Kiriana just wouldn't be possible. So look, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming. And please, you've got feedback forms like these in your folders, um, or you can receive them on the way out in the door. Please do take two minutes to fill them out. They're really important so we can keep providing these lectures for you. Thank you very much, and enjoy. Kiritato, good evening, everyone. Um, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce a man who I'm sure to many of you doesn't actually need much of an introduction. Um, it's distinguished Professor Bill Denny. Uh, and Bill has had a stellar career uh, in New Zealand and overseas in terms of cancer research. Originally trained uh, here at Auckland University and then Oxford University. Uh, Bill has had a string of achievements and we'd be here for the next hour if I was to ring them, uh, read them all out. 
Uh, but uh, I think the most, um, perhaps the one recognition that I really want to make is he's a Rutherford Medalist of the Royal Society of New Zealand, an Adrian Albert Medalist of the UK Royal Society, and an officer of the New Zealand Order of Merit for his services to cancer research. Uh, Bill is the current director of the Auckland Cancer Society Research Centre. Uh, please welcome Bill Denny. Thank you very much, John. And uh, welcome everyone here. It's really good to see so many people here on, as they say, a wet night. What I'd like to do is to ah, talk briefly about the work we're doing in the Cancer Centre to develop new drugs for cancer therapy. Now, drug development is a very multidisciplinary exercise. You need, first of all, the computer modellers to try to design the targets you want to hit. You need the chemists, obviously, to design and make the drugs that you want those to be those targets to hit with. You need the biologists, the pharmacologists, the cancer clinicians to take those drugs further into their development. And the work in the lab is enabled by collaborations outside with other scientists and clinicians and with outside companies as well, because it's a very expensive journey outside the lab as well to get a drug through into clinical trial. And we've done this with a number of large commercial companies, with a number of small companies, and even there on the bottom here are uh, some of our own venture capital startup companies. And with these partners, the centre has to, to date taken 12 new cancer drugs into clinical trials, some in New Zealand and the rest around the world. Now, the early drugs that we used for cancer targeted DNA. And that was logical because it's, DNA, it's errors in the DNA that cause the errors in the proteins which cause cells to become cancerous. But unfortunately, at that time, we didn't know enough to be able to target the subtle differences in the sequence of DNA that really the mutations are all about. And instead, these drugs, like the intercalators, just broke the DNA strands and the drugs, like the alkylators, link the two strands together. And both of those things means the cell can't divide, the cell dies, and these, cells are, these drugs are very effective at killing cancer cells. They're relatively unselective at killing normal cells as well, so they have toxicities associated with them. But what we understand today is the staggering complexity of a human cell and the proteins inside it. Each of you is made up of about 10 trillion cells, so they're all very small. But even so, each cell packs into it more than 10,000 different proteins. And a lot of these proteins are linked and hooked up into signaling networks here, which exchange signals among each other and signals from the outside that control when, when a cell divides and when it doesn't. A lot of them act essentially as switches to turn things on and off. And each of those individual proteins are made up of thousands of different atoms so that each, the pro each protein has a very specific structure. And it's only when we can get down into the atomic level and look at these at the level of each atom that we see the unique differences between them and can start designing compounds that target one protein among the 10,000 or so. So what I'd like to do today is to talk very briefly about three types of projects in the centre. One of them is drugs to control these signalling enzymes. And you can see here a, a small part, part of, of this, this particular, particular EGF receptor enzyme. And each of these little green bumps is a single atom. So you can see now that at that level we can see this big gap, this big hole in the, um, in the protein, and we can learn how to design drugs to bind into that hole. I'd also ta talk briefly about two other projects. One, a long-standing project, is drugs targeting the hypoxic cells that are specific to cancers because they exist a long way from the bloodstream and they lack oxygen. And finally, a little bit about the way we're now finally starting to approach the even more complex immune system to talk about drugs which can boost the immune system's capability. But coming back to the first point, the... EGF receptor is one of these switch proteins. It happens to sit in the membrane, a 
across the membrane and it takes signals from outside, transmits them through into the inside and essentially acts as a switch to turn, tell cells whether to turn on or turn off. And of course some of the problems is that mutations cause these enzymes to be stuck in the on position where they're continually dividing. Now you can see here that by use of this mo these modeling techniques we can in fact design drugs that fit very tightly and very neatly into this pocket that's been provided in the enzyme and shut it off from functioning. The, the trouble with this is that this, these drugs bind reversibly, they come in, they bind, they leave again and the enzyme is only blockaded when there's, la when there's high amounts of drug in, in the system but as that drug gets metabolized the drugs can move out again and the, the, the period of shutdown is relatively smaller than we would like. So our particular contribution to this area has been to note that these drugs bind in this pocket in the same way each time and therefore we can use that general binding to deliver a fairly reactive unit on the drug to a reactive unit on the protein. And separately, those two things are not very reactive, but bring them close together and they link to form a permanent bond. So those drugs are then irreversibly bound and the, 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 cancer is, the uh, enzyme is shut down permanently. And conertinib, from our collaboration with Pfizer, was the first of these irreversible inhibitors to reach human trials a few years back. And, we've, and we used on it a particular locking unit called an acrylamide. And to date, there are about 10 of these irreversible inhibitors in clinical use, targeting different enzymes and therefore being of different structure and generated through many different companies. But all of them use the original locking unit that we originally devised. The second area I'd like to talk about briefly is to selectively targeting the so-called hypoxic or uh, low oxygen cells that exist in the center of solid tumors. This is a cross section through a solid tumor and you can see here the blood vessels. Here you can see in the red and black the oxygen oxygenated cells close to the blood vessels still fully dividing and far away from the blood vessels in the green you see the hypoxic cells that are viable but shut down and not cycling. And these are really unique to cancer tissue. So there's a difference. Can we exploit that difference? Because these hypoxic cells are difficult to kill with conventional drugs because they're remote from the blood vessels, they're shut down, they're not replicating, so most of the standard drugs don't work. But if you do treat these tumours with no normal drugs and you kill out all the oxygenated cells, then oxygen is free to flow again and turn these cells back on to regenerate the tumour, and that's what happens in so many cases. So we've been looking at what we call hypoxia-activated prodrugs, which contain an oxygen sensor linked through to an inactive form of the drug, and these are designed to be fairly stable, safe and non-toxic, until they distribute through into these hypoxic regions when the sensor recognises the lack of oxygen and then starts a process that results in fragmentation of the drug to release the active form. And ideally then this active form will redistribute to kill some of the oxygenated cancer cells as well. We currently have three drugs that have reached clinical trial in this area, PO104, taloxotinib and a drug called CPT006. And you can see from this example of taloxotinib uh, treating a animal model of a solid tumour before treatment, you can image the hypoxic cells in green, but after treatment with the drug, uh, those have all gone away. They've all been taken out. So these stunts do work in these models, and um, we're hopeful that uh, we'll get successful clinical trials with one of these compounds in the near future. And finally, the immune system until recently was so complicated that we couldn't even contemplate how we could affect that, how we could help that to, its job is to seek out and destroy foreign cells. So it's our front line defense against cancers. But cancers have many ways in which they can first of all block the processes by which the immune cells take out cancers. 
and secondly, simply weaken the immune response generally. And the project in the centre here targeted at this second point is looking at a, another protein called CSF1 receptor, which is secreted by cancers, and in so doing, it can recruit the patient's own immune cells, the macrophages, to, to start generating growth factors which cause the cells to be stimulated and to, to grow. So the effect, it subverts the immune system's response. And by shutting this down, we can stop this process. And so we've been, again, in the early stage, there's, there's so far only two drugs in the clinic targeting this enzyme. It's early days, but we have a program running for the last couple of years looking at modelling the pockets in this enzyme where we can bind drugs to, and now have a series of um, selective and very potent compounds that we're trying to evolve through into finding a clinical candidate in the next couple of years. But the question that we can pose is, how, what's the value of all this research? What sort of impact is it making in cancer treatment when you get out of the lab? And one of the best ways we could perhaps talk about that with a single number is looking at the percentage of patients in New Zealand who survive for 10 years or longer after diagnosis. And you can see that through a combination of better lifestyles, better screening, because early screening is important, and better treatment, and that includes better surgery, radiotherapy, and not least, the whole pile of new drugs that have been coming through over the last many years. The 10-year plus year survival rate has improved from less than a quarter of all people when, when I started work, actually, uh, through to about nearly 60% now. And that's a real improvement. But of course, it begs the immediate question, how can we make that better? How can we continue this improvement? And I think just to finish off, there are three areas which I think are going to bear on that in the near future. First of all, earlier and more accurate screening. Because if we can identify cancers early, we can treat them more effectively. And being able to identify the tiny amounts of tumour DNA that's released by dying tumour cells into the bloodstream at an early stage will allow us to have uh, simply detect that DNA through blood tests. And that will obviously be very much cheaper, very much more uh, simpler than the, what we have to go through now. Now, this technology is not quite there yet, but there's an awful lot of work going on around the world. And I'm fairly confident that in the next few years, we'll be able to see increasingly our ability to identify tumour DNA from blood samples early, early on. Secondly, better matching of patients and drugs. Um, the way in which a patient responds to a drug depends on the genetics of that tumour and the genetics of the patient. And in any particular tumour, treat, treating a group of people with the same type of cancer, you'll get some people that are not, that where the drug is not effective, and we really don't want to be treating those people with that drug. So based on tumour and patient genetics, better matching of patients to drugs in a personalised approach is coming along very rapidly, and I think we'll hear a bit more about that later on. And finally, there is a whole slew of new drugs coming through, and particularly the immunotherapy drugs, um, and these are increasingly based on individual patient genetics. And I think those three areas where we are seeing big progress going on in the science will feed through to treatment in the next few years. So I've very briefly, I'm afraid, discussed a few of the cancer drug development programs going on in the centre. And of course, I remind you that across the faculty, there's a very large research effort into all areas, all aspects of cancer diagnosis, treatment and therapy and support. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Bill, um, before you run away. We have a format where there's time. We have time for one question from the audience. Stunned a bit, I've got a question. Bill, what's the 
biggest challenge for you in your discipline of medicinal chemistry for the next 10 years? Keeping up with the flood of data that's coming through from everybody else, basically, <laughs> so that you can actually do something that's different to what everyone else is doing. With the um, kinase inhibitors I talked about, we were the first to do a certain thing. That's followed through with everyone else. The hypoxia programs we've been running for a long time. None of those are yet successful, but we finally know, I think, all of the things we need to know. And the next compound, couple of compounds that come through from the lab have a much better chance of actually getting, the, getting approved. Well, well done. Thank you very much, Bill. It's exciting work. I'd like to um, move on and introduce our next speaker, who's Professor Laming Ching, who is at the Auckland Cancer Society Research Centre as well. She's been um, well trained here, but moved overseas to Toronto and Seattle and worked there before coming back to head up the stromal targeting group at the centre, specialising in approaches to res restore the capacity of the normal cells in the tumour stroma to fight the cancer. The title of her talk is Boosting Our Immune System to Fight Cancer. Amen. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, yes, so I work out of the Auckland Cancer Society Research Centre, which is just over there uh, next to the toilets. And you're welcome to come visit us. Um, now, what I want to do in my talk is to expand upon some of the... Um, advances and approaches that harness the immune system um, to kill the cancer. Now, now, we all, everybody here has a functioning immune system that we use to ward off infections from um, bugs and bacterium and viruses, as well as mutated cancer cells. And by far the most effective way uh, arm of the immune system that can seek out and destroy the cancer cells are what we call the killer T cells. Now below, uh, the before and after shot of a melanoma cells that have been killed by these white cells which are the immune T cells. Now when the immune T cells spots a melanoma cell, it rolls towards it sniff around, and when they decide that, yes, indeed, that's a nasty cell that we wish to get rid of, they release a product called, um, a protein called perforin onto the surface, and that serves to punch these great big holes that you might be able to pick out here, and then the cancer cell just releases all its bloods and guts and, and dies. <laughs> and then the T cells just go off and find other cancer cells to kill. So they're serial killers. <laughs> um, and we've known about these killer T cells since the 1960s. And since the 1990s, we've been madly trying to harness them for use as therapy. But it's only recently that with all the new latest technologies and our ability to separate these out from the blood of patients and to be able to grow them um, outside the body in incubators in, dare I say it, giant plastic bags that we use only once and toss. <laughs> but none have been found in the belly of whales and sea turtles yet. None. And those cells, we half us will then put back to the patient in a process called adoptive T cell transfer. Um, and in December 2013, Science, one of our top rated scientific journals, claimed it as the breakthrough of the year. But very soon after that, scientists took these endogenous natural T cells and they added bits and pieces to it to make it better. And those are called chimeric antigen receptor or CAR T cells. Now, if I was to liken these two different types of cells to models of cars, then these are your Toyota Corollas. Very reliable, very dependable, and will get you to work no trouble. But these CAR T cells are your Mercedes Benzes. 
they don't get you to work any faster, but you enjoy the two hour sit and rush hour traffic much more. Now, the results from recent clinical trials of CAR T cells for leukemia have come up with statements such as this. Patients had eight pounds of leukemia that just melted away. Now, you can tell that it must have come from an American trial because the rest of the world have used on, moved on to metrics, but they're still in pounds and ounces. Now, to put this eight pounds of leukemia into some perspective, um, eight pounds converts to about 3.6 kilos, and the average weight of a leukemia cell is about two nanograms. So if you do the calculations, that converts to two million million leukemia cells that have been killed. So if I told you that these normal natural T cells are serial killers, these CAR T cells are your weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> now, unfortunately, Auckland doesn't have a factory for making CAR T cells, but I think it would be, I think it would be neat if we could raise the funding somehow to produce CAR T cells and these weapons of mass destruction in our local war against cancer. Now, T cells, be it the souped up CAR T cells or the normal natural T cells, when they get tired from killing, they express breaks um, on, on this surface. Now, scientists have made antibodies to those breaks, which covers up the immune checkpoint blockade, the immune checkpoints, which is a more scientific term for the breaks. And they prevent the cells from being, um, they block the breaks from being applied. And the poor old T cells have to continue to kill on and on and on and keep on going, no matter how tired and how much it wants to retire. Now, initially, these antibodies, the immune checkpoint blockades, were made so the scientists could understand, use it as tools to understand how T cells were regulated. But when they were trialed as a therapy in its own right, um, the results were absolutely spectacular. And the T cell has lots of immune checkpoints, but the first ones to be trialed were the anti-CTLA-4 antibodies, the pilimumab and trimmer I don't know. And the second lot were the anti PD1 antibodies. They were trialed, firstly, in, against advanced malignant melanoma, patients who have failed all previous therapies and were expected to live only a few more months. Um, but on Ipilum, Ip, Ipi for short, the immune checkpoint blockade therapy was found to induce durable responses. In some of the patients, it's now been over 15 years that they have been alive. And this led to oncologists saying, it's not inconceivable that patients may live virtually disease-free for years using approaches that harness the immune system. Um, so let's have a closer look at the data, and this is IPI on a group of 4,846 melanoma patients. And you can see that um, there is a drop-off, but if you're alive after three years on IPI, then <coughs> you're expected that you will survive out to well past 10 years. And so that is wonderful and much, much better than the current chemotherapies where it just drops off within a year. But, and in this group of nearly 5,000 patients, we have saved about 1,000. But there's still the other 4,000 that IPI could not save. And so the big question is, and the big challenge is, how do we try and bring that <coughs> tail further up? There are two approaches currently. 
One is to use the genetic, um, the tools of precision medicine and, and sequence the genome of the patients who have responded well and try and identify why they are better <coughs> responders. And the other way is to use combination therapy. If one immune checkpoint blockade will give you that many cures, then let's add more and more. And both approaches have provided positive results because we now know that the, that the tumors that respond well, they have a higher tumor, uh, mut mutation burden than the ones which are responding pure badly, and that's because there's a defect in the gene that corrects for all the mutations. And in combination therapy, where you add more and more, um, give more than one immune checkpoint blockade, yes, you can get, you can push the, <coughs> the, the tail up. This is a P, and you can get 22%, which are um, alive long, long term. And this is the response from nivolumab, or Nevo for short, um, that will give you 48% of the patients getting durable responses. But the combination of the two is greater than the sum of 48 and 22%, so it's synergistic. Now, so why aren't we doing more and more combinations? Well, these immune checkpoint blockades come with a price. They have a lot of <coughs> bad toxicities <coughs> associated with it. With IPI, for a 22% um, long-term survival, it comes with 23% of the patients getting bad adverse effects. Nevo is a better drug. It gives you 48% long-term survivors with only a 16.3% of adverse toxicities. The combination, unfortunately, the toxicities seem to be also synergistic. So, and some of these toxicities are so debilitating, the patients choose to come off it. So can we find combinations where um, you can get better responses, but not the toxicities? Now, maybe. This is a replot of the graphs that, that I showed you, and it's called a waterfall plot. And it's of, um, and this is of Nevo and Ipi against the melanoma patients. And you can see not all of them, um, the, the tumor shrinks, but the majority does. And here are the ones where all the tumor has gone. And as I said, this combination gives, you have 55% of your patients suffering three and, grade three and four adverse events. Now, if we show the, um, the waterfall plot from Nevo, same as that one, plus another drug called Ipacadostat, Ipacadost I don't make up these names and I don't know who does. <laughs> Again, they were, 19, they were metastatic melanoma patients that were not expected to survive for um, long periods. Um, but here they were getting very good responses, similar to this, and these have all d disappeared. But look at a percentage of toxicities, 11% compared with 55%. Um, so epocodostat belongs to a new class of drugs that are called IDO1 inhibitors. Would people like to hear more about these? Yes. Good, thank goodness for that. Because <laughs> I've spent the last 10 years of my life working on these. <laughs> now, 
IDO1 is an enzyme that converts tryptophan to kyurinine. Tryptophan is an essential amino acid that cells require in order to make proteins. Now, it's been shown that many cancer cells express IDO1, which accelerates conversion of tryptophan to kyurinine, and perhaps either the decrease in tryptophan concentrations or the increase in kyurinine and downstream toxic metabolites results in suppression of the cancer-killing T cells. And it's been shown that many cancers express IGO as a way of suppressing the immune system. And patients whose tumors are expressing a lot of IGO-1 have a poorer survival, a poorer prognosis. So it's a no-brainer, really, that, are we sh that we should try and develop drugs that block this enzyme, and then we could use it to restore the activity of the immune cells that kill the cancer. And we and many other groups have been trying to sort of do that. Now, so next door, next to the toilets, I had a team, we developed assays that allow a team of students to sift through as many compounds as they could to look for IDO inhibitors. And we actually went through over 40,000. And we got a, quite a few, 228, but not every single compound can be converted or is suitable for conversion or use as a pharmaceutical. Um, we needed compounds that could get into cells because IDO is an intracellular protein. We also did not want the compound to be cytotoxic and kill off the immune cells or other normal cells. We wanted the compounds to have good metabolic stability so it's not converted quickly to a useless compound as soon as you give it to patients. And we certainly wanted ones where you could give as a pill, because it's so much more convenient than asking your patients to come in for intravenous infusions. And once we'd sort of put all the compounds through all these tests, we ended up with about three. And, but the most promising ones has been licensed to a biopharmaceutical company who will have who will help us take it through into clinical trials. Now, in April 6, 2015, Nature Biotechnology had an editorial saying that IDO inhibitors move center stage in immuno-oncology, and Chemical and Engineering News had the front, had the cover on IDO inhibitors, unleashing the immune system to combat cancer. Now, I'd love to be able to sort of say that this happened because of the wonderful work we were doing, but unfortunately, no. That was when these two companies, they started two years after us, um, but with their bigger, deeper pockets and, and a bigger staff, got their IDO inhibitors into phase one trials much earlier. Um, and very soon after that, the big guns, Bristol Myers Squibb and Pfizer, had their IDOs in phase one clinical trials. Now, three years later, it's now 2018, where are we? Where are they? Well, Neulix Genetics was the first one to withdraw, and we, weren't, we still don't know whether it was because the IDO inhibitor didn't work, or Genentech's um, immune checkpoint blockade, which was untested at that time, um, didn't work. But we weren't worried because the Pocodostat was barreling along and was in phase two and getting good, good results. But then, early this year, Pfizer stopped recruiting patients with brain cancer for use with their IDO in inhibitors. They had only recruited 19 and decided to stop, which I thought was rather strange because normally one doesn't expect much 
in phase one trials um, with the monotherapy, but it didn't, but epicodostat was still bearing along, and this time in phase three trials in combination with Merck's anti-PD-1. Um, but when in April 2018, they announced, Merck announced that they were no longer continuing to go ahead with um, Insights ID01 inhibitor. It did put everybody in a bit of a spin. Beca and very soon after Bristol Myers Squibb, just a couple of weeks afterwards, decided that they would stop recruiting <coughs> on, for their phase three trials of their in-house IDO1 inhibitor and their in-house um, um, immune checkpoint blockade. Um, Bristol Myers Squibb had just recruited 72 of the 700 odd patients that we're hoping to, to put on, onto the phase three trials. But both Bristol Myers Squibb and Insight are not saying, um, they're just taking a breather. Um, a, so they can sort of go back and analyze all the subsets in their phase two trials, which were, had very good results. And they just want to analyze the the patients that did respond so they could find the markers of selecting ones that will respond versus those that don't and make sure that going forward they recruit the ones that will re re respond. We at the same time have also um, put the trials of our IDO inhibitor on hold and at the moment we're back in the lab trying to understand more about the relationship of IDO1 and TDO, because the body has two enzymes to do the same pathway of converting tryptophan to kynurenine. And we had um, preclinical data that suggested that when we in used IDO1 inhibitors to inhibit IDO1 to cure cancer, <coughs> um, I forgot. <laughs> well, the increase in tryptophan sent a feedback message to the liver, which is, expresses the TDO, and it's TDO who's, no, who's responsible for the normal homeostasis of tryptophan in, in the blood in circulation. And so when the liver gets the message to increase the IDO, activity, then it converts tryptophan to kynurenine and just counter, counteracts the effect of the IDO inhibitors that we want to reverse, um, to restore tum anti-tumor immunity. And if this is what's happening, then IDO inhibitors on their own may not be effective and you need to sort of perhaps be giving an inhibitor of TDO at the same time, and it just so happens we, we have in the lab some lovely IDO selective and dual inhibitors of IDO and TDO, and of our, depending on the results of our current laboratory studies, we could, the ACSRC could be in a very good position to be one of the first groups to put TDO inhibitors into clinical trials. Now, am I out of time? <laughs> Pity. Well, <laughs> I did want to thank everybody and my funders, the Cancer, CSAN and AMRF. And since they get their funding from the generosity of the public, Auckland public. Thank you for your generosity and donations. Thank you very much, Lei Ming. Um, 
when we were planning this evening, we were very conscious that it is a winter's night and we didn't want to keep you all too long. So we are sticking very much to the timetable, but I'm uh, assured that our speakers will be around at the end of the event. So if you do have some questions, I'm sure there'll be an opportunity to, uh, to uh, connect up with one of the speakers after the event. So, um, so moving right along. Um, next up, we have Professor Kristen Print, uh, who's going to be talking about genomics for cancer patients. Uh, Chris graduated uh, in medicine from the University of Auckland um, and then worked as a house surgeon uh, in Dunedin before completing an, an immunology PhD in Auckland. Um, Chris now leads the Genomics into Medicine program at Auckland University. He's currently professor of the university's Department of Mole Molecular Medicine and Pathology uh, and a principal investigator uh, in the Morris Wilkins Centre. And I think still um, very much demonstrating his connection with clinical practice, he's uh, the immediate past president of the New Zealand Society of Oncology. So without further ado, uh, welcome Chris. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you for coming out on such a wet night. My talk's going to be much shorter than Lay Ming's because it's an area that is very difficult to explain easily because it is based in technology. So I'll have a shot though. <laughs> so what I'd like to do is break my talk into three areas. First of all, I want to introduce what genomics is and how this disruptive technology of genomics is really transforming our understanding of cancer and moving into transforming patient care. Then after that, I'm going to talk about genomics as a way to transform what we can understand about the complexity of tumours and how it's really telling us how little we actually know. Just when we think we know everything, we get knocked off our feet. And then finally, I want to talk about the implications for New Zealand patients, people with cancer in New Zealand from genomics. So genomics is a truly disruptive technology. It's the study of genes and genomes, all of your 20-odd thousand genes and the myriad of proteins they make. How does all of this integrate together to make the signaling pathways in cells that um, Bill Denny and Lei Ming Ching showed you? The more we study genomics, the more we understand about how cells work, but at the same time, the more we know we don't understand. I said it's a disruptive technology, and it's really technology-led. When I went through Auckland Medical School 30-something years ago, we didn't learn about genomics at all. But nowadays, we use small DNA sequencing machines with the second-year medical students who sequence something. Just five or 10 years ago, we had these massive sequencing machines that took up most of a room. Now we've got ones you can hold in your hand and plug into your laptop, or even better, ones that plug into your iPhone. This is an iPhone just here with it plugged in the bottom. In a survey that a very talented PhD student, a surgeon, Deborah Wright, working with me did in 2011, a very high proportion of cancer specialists in New Zealand predicted that the frequency of use of genomic and similar molecular assays and their influence on their clinical decisions for patients would increase. So there's a really high expectation, in the clinical community at least, that we have to live up to with genomics. So I'm going to give you now a couple of examples where genomics have transformed something in our understanding of cancer. And this first example was led by my colleague Annette Lasham in collaboration with University of Otago researchers led by Anthony Braithwaite and some Sydney researchers. And this is an example where we looked at over a thousand breast tumours and we looked at all of the genes in each of those breast tumours and how they were used. By building computer models, we were able to work out that a particular protein in these cells called YB1 acted as a trigger that turned on a proliferation or cell division mechanism in these cells. We didn't know this previously. Previously, we had no idea how YB1 really worked 
or rather we thought it worked in many different ways and just weren't sure. YB1 turns out to be a protein or a gene that you can measure in cells to identify the prognosis of patients. And we've been very lucky in that using similar techniques to what Lei Ming has described, we've been able to use high throughput screening to get a small number of chemical compounds that appear to inhibit the action of YB1, which we hope may be the start of understanding how to develop a drug. When we did this work, we found that in about 8% of ovarian cancers, about 4% of breast cancers, this YB1 gene is so important for the growth of the cancers that it's copied, and there's many, many copies of the gene. So that's an example using genomics linked with mathematics. We call that bioinformatics to really understand an individual molecule. But actually, the way cancers evolve, they start at individual cells, which then divide and get more and more mutations as they continue to grow. And this is a form of evolution in practice. In a study led by Ben Lawrence, Mike Finlay, myself, and several colleagues in the room into neuroendocrine tumours, we've started to untangle the whole genome complexity of these cancers. This is a graph just showing how different chromosomes in these tumours have different numbers of copies or different splits between the originally inherited alleles from two parents. In many of these tumours, about 25%, the tumours appear to be driven to grow, not by mutations, but by complex loss and gain of whole chromosomes. The same 10 chromosomes appear to be lost in about 25% of the tumours. We've no idea how this works yet. So this is a brand new complexity that we've discovered using genomics about how cancer cells grow. All of this new discovery about how cancer cells grow is leading to us understanding how we can improve treatments. In the graph that Layman showed you, where there was a tail off of survival, we want to use genomics to better predict which patients can do well with treatment. And in the other patients who don't do so well, to be able to identify why. The ultimate goal would be to play chess with tumours, to sequence treatments based on the genomic evolution of the tumour. But that still remains in the future. In the area of pathology, there used to be this phrase, the therapeutic funnel, where people would talk about a variety of different histological or microscopic appearances of tumours, and they'd use this to help identify which drugs would be used. And then, as genomics started to have an impact on pathology, we started to talk about a therapeutic prism. And this is an example in lung cancer, which Mark McKeague is going to talk further about, about how different mutations and different genes can help identify likelihoods of responses or resistance to different therapies. These days, though, we're trying to go beyond this and combine whole genome information to integrate in mathematical models everything we know about a tumour to better predict what drug, what prognosis, and to match the right drug to the right person. As was alluded to by Bill Denny, one of the most exciting technologies is using the sensitivity of genomics to follow cancers through their evolution. I've got a colleague in Otago, Neil Gemmell, who's sequencing Loch Ness to try and prove once and for all that there is or is not a Loch Ness monster. And the reason he can do that is that DNA sequencing is so sensitive that it can detect a few molecules which presumably have a Loch Ness monster specific DNA sequence <laughs> in the whole lock. Well, we can do the same thing in the much smaller lock of the human uh, blood. And this is a slide from a project led by Sandra Fitzgerald, Rosalie Stevens, John Matthew, and several other clinicians in Auckland, where we're trying to follow patients through the immune checkpoint inhibitors that Lei Ming Ching told you about to identify whether patients are responding or not very early on. And this is following through three courses of these checkpoint inhibitors, and sadly, this is 
an example of a patient who is not responding. As these graphs are trending upwards, this is telling you that the amount of mutations that have leaked out of the tumour into the patient's blood is gradually increasing as the tumours continue to grow despite the therapy. So I'd like to conclude by first of all reiterating that this disruptive technology of genomics and all the computer work that goes with it is truly transforming what we know about cancer. But it's also telling us how much we don't know. The major limitation to how we can use genomics in the clinic is how much we don't know about genes and proteins and tumour cells. And this is why basic fundamental research, such as is funded by the Cancer Society, ARMRF and many others, remains critically important. We've not solved cancer, we've just learned how much more we need to do. The second point I wanted to make is that genomics is genuinely beginning to guide precision oncology. Patients are genuinely starting to benefit. However, there's a few inequities creeping into this. As a rather socialist person, I'd love to see the democratisation of genomics and genomics being freely and equally available. One of the ways that we're hoping to be able to do that is with some of these new technologies, like measuring the circulating tumour DNA. Measuring mutations in patients' blood can be easily done on a Mirai clinic or away from a hospital. And we're hoping that this isn't another perpetuator of inequity in health in New Zealand, but rather these technologies can actually reduce inequities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris, a lovely talk. Um, any questions from the floor? I think that's probably a lame in question. I, I, do you want me to hand it over to you? <laughs> Give it a go, Chris. <laughs> this is a adoptive cell transfer approach, I understand, if I'm thinking of the right paper. And I think the main challenge with it is to use technologies like genomics to identify why this is working in some patients and not others. Professor Rod Dunbar in Auckland is working up these technologies in New Zealand. We're very lucky that we've got a very active research program into these technologies here. Thank you. We will move on uh, for the benefit of time. So thank you very much, Chris, for your talk. It's now my distinct uh, pleasure and honour to introduce uh, Professor Bruce Bagley, distinguished Professor Bruce Bagley. Uh, Bruce um, grew up in Hamilton and uh, trained as a, initially as a chemist, but saw the light and moved into biology. Uh, he then did a postdoc after his PhD in Auckland, did a postdoc in, uh, in Switzerland, and returned in 1968 to work in what is now known as the Auckland Cancer Society Research Center. Uh, since that time, he's either been director or co-director. Someone's phone. Um, and Bruce, uh, his major research interest has been in the development of anti-cancer drugs where comprehensive laboratory studies can be complemented by clinical trials in cancer patients. So with that introduction, I'd like to uh, welcome Bruce to the podium. Thanks, Mike, and thanks, everybody, for being here. Can everybody hear? OK. Um, makes it even better. That one? Oh. So this uh, title of this talk, it was actually not my idea. Uh, it was somehow got transposed, but then I started thinking about it and thought, well, actually, it's quite a good, quite a good talk. Quite, quite a title because, um, as you see from what I want to talk about, this really makes sense. 
Um, oh. I want, particularly since it's uh, 50 years from the start of the medical school, to, to go back in time a little bit, because the, the year the medical school started here was also the year that I started with uh, Bruce Kane's team. And Bruce was not only a, an amazing uh, medicinal chemist, but he had a real um, concern for cancer patients and trying to develop new treatments for cancer, which at that stage was quite at a, quite an early stage. So he, one of the first things he did for me was to introduce me to a clinician, John Buchanan, who is a haematologist. And John, when I talked to him, said that one of their problems was that they had a new drug, exciting new drug, uh, for treating uh, leukemia, uh, but it only worked in some patients, not others. And so was there a way of picking in advance which patients might respond and which patients don't respond? And since it was a, a, a blood uh, condition, perhaps we could get a blood sample, which is quite easy to take, or well, hopefully most patients, easy to take, and we could use that to decide whether the patients might respond or not. Now, I don't want to talk about this, the actual project, because it was quite interesting. But one of the things which uh, was important for me personally was that I got to talk to patients. So we would go every week to the hospital and, and collect uh, blood samples for these studies. And that, so I, for the first time really in my career, I got to talk to a lot of cancer patients about what their views were and what their aspirations were. And one of the things which um, struck me particularly was that they wanted to help other people. So a lot of the, their willingness to provide samples and so on was aimed at helping people in the future. And so I was quite inspired by the, the people that I, that I met at that time, and it sort of shaped my career since then. Now, I want to leap forward a little bit now, because it's about probably another 20 years. And over that time, there's a whole lot of uh, technological advances in how we could uh, look at cancer cells and the kind of equipment and, and the lab was, was changing. And not only that, we had some, some good people that are, are arriving. Graham Finlay uh, joined the group, and he was an expert on cell culture and a very good person to have in the lab. Uh, John Matthews was an enthusiast for cancer treatment. He was a clinician and wanted to see how we could bring ideas from the lab uh, back to the cancer patient. So we're in a good position to do that. And we thought that one of the things we'd like to do is to take a sample uh, when a patient had surgery for other types of cancer, take a sample and, and culture it in the lab and then find out uh, by exposing those cultured cells to, to different drugs as to which one was the best one for the patient. And we could go a little bit further and, and say, well, if we had those cultures, we could use those to assess new drugs that were coming out of Bruce Kane's program. So this would have a double advantage in a way if we could make that kind of system work. Well, in 1989, we had a, some good luck in a way because we employed, uh, with the help of um, funding from the Health Research Council, employed Elaine Marshall uh, to do this. And she was not only a very excellent person for getting these cells to grow, she had really sort of green fingers for this, but she also knew how to, to talk to patients and get their permission because we needed ethical permission for all this. Uh, she knew how to talk to the theatre nurses and so on so that the, uh, the samples from the surgery uh, came to the lab rather than being thrown out. Um, she talked to the surgeons and pathologists because all of those people had to be involved in this whole process. And so she was a real gem as far as uh, this pro project was uh, concern and behind her she, we had another person, Wayne, Wayne Joseph, who's still working with us in fact, uh, who acted as a fantastic backup person, could do those things as well. So we're very lucky to have that kind of system going. So what do these cells look like? Once they've, uh, this, we get them from surgery and um, 
take them into the lab, the first thing we do is to actually um, cut them up into very small pieces because they have to be uh, apportioned out to, to various tiny, tiny, tiny cultures. And so this picture here is probably magnified about a thousand times, and each of these little clumps have got several hundred humor cells. And if you go one further, and this is now another hundred times further magnified, so sort of something like 100,000 fold magnification, you can see um, what looks strange. It's, you'd be forgiven for thinking it looks like spaghetti and meatballs. But the, the spot of spaghetti is actually fibers like collagen, which form a kind of a nest for, for the tumor to, to grow in. And the gray parts are, are the tumor cells themselves. Now, one of the problems when we uh, take this tissue uh, from surgery and mention we have to cut it up into tiny bits, that induces a reaction uh, called a wounding response, as you might imagine. If you take a piece of tissue and, and chop it up, uh, it's going to cause a lot of um, physical damage, and the body reacts to that uh, by uh, certain cells that start dividing to try and repair that damage. And so you've got to be very careful. If you are, are doing this, you end up looking at the, uh, the response rather than the tumour itself. So we had to d differentiate those things. And Graham Finlay found a nice way of being able to suppress the wounding response. And so we can actually just look at the, at the effects of, the, of on the cancer cells themselves. This is, it's actually not a robot. It's like, well, on the other end of this is, is Wayne, and the reason it's shaking a bit is because I'm, I'm on the camera. Uh, but this is a type of manipulation that we had to do hundreds of times over um, to apportion these uh, cells in tiny amounts into these little microcultures. Now, if that doesn't go, just a minute. So of the many hundreds of patients, this is just a selection, so you can see that there are many different types of tumors that we got samples from, and many different uh, surgeons that were involved in these projects. And these are just some of the surgeons. And this is a project which is still going on, and we're just sort of completing it now. Uh, but it's been going for uh, 30 years. It's a long project. And you can see how you need to have a, a large number of samples in order to really find out what's going on. And one of the things we uh, looked for, we thought we grow these cultures that we might find for a particular patient when we grew these cultures, that the, those cells were really responsive to, to one of the drugs and they didn't work with others. And so in that way, we could say, this is the drug that we should use for that patient. And for another patient, another one would light up and we could use that one. Well, it didn't really work out the same as like that we found that there was a tendency uh, when we got a sample from a patient that either it was sort of sens sensitive to everything or it was resistant to everything. So what was going on that we could get a picture like that? It took us a long time to, to understand what was happening and the result was that um, these different cultures were actually growing at different rates. And we found that the, the growth rate in culture uh, related to what was going on in the patient as well. And we went further than that and uh, had to get involved with sort of mathematical modeling and so on and, and people uh, with mathematicians try and work out on a population basis what was going on. So it's a long, long process, but it was a very interesting set of results because we, we found things that we hadn't expected before. Now, I just wanted to stop a moment and, and talk about what's, what's in cancer tissue because you sort of think of, of cancer tissue as being uh, just cancer cells. In fact, there's a lot of different cells in there and doing different things. So apart from the, the uh, cancer cells and this, this uh, fibrous sort of little nest for the tumor uh, and the fibroblasts that make that nest, there's also a blood supply and you can see in this, this picture here um, there's, a, there's a colored red cell here, and this is a, it's a capillary uh, containing the blood supply for that particular tumor. And also you have immune cells that Laming has talked about, but also you have what might call a sanitation system 
you need cells specialised that dispose of the corpses of, of the dead tumour cells. And why do you need this? Well, I might just start with the question of how fast a tumour grows in a, in a human. How long does it take for a tumour to actually double its volume? And it might be surprising to you to find out that the time taken to du double the volume of the average human tumour is about four months. So it grows more slowly than we perhaps give them credit for. Although some uh, tumours will grow faster than that. And that means, if you uh, think about the mathematics of this, is, is that um, you can find out that individual cancer cells double their number in about a week, but the tumour itself doubles its number in about four months. And this means that uh, there's a cell death going on. It's not all of the cells from the tumour continue. They, they, they are dying off at quite a rate. And this is a post, uh, process called turnover. And uh, you can sort of think about that, or you can go and talk to an accountant who knows all about turnover. It's the same sort of process, though, but um, it's possible just to ignore this and say, well, the cells die, and it's, that's all, all the rest to it. Uh, and that different tumours have different rates of turnover, so different uh, numbers of, of dead cells are being formed and, and transported away uh, by the sanitation system. Well, why is that important? It's important because dying cancer cells themselves uh, send out a signal uh, which is effective on, on the whole immune system. And so dying cells make a signal to the sanitation system uh, cells that, that tell it to eat it up because that's the way that these cells are got rid of because other cells eat them up. Um, but depending on how many you have, uh, the system can get um, pushed in one, one direction or, or another. So if it's on a sort of an active phase, then this, the system actually um, works together with the immune system that Lei Ming was talking about and getting rid of uh, tumour cells, recognising them and getting rid of them. If it's being sort of overloaded, it goes to another mode called wound healing, where uh, it is really primarily concerned with uh, mopping up the damage uh, and, and it actually suppresses the immunity. So that's a, a really important area if we can understand that perhaps on some tumours they're sort of exhausted as far as their immune pro uh, properties are concerned and they stop, stop working properly. So, um, in fact, Stacey on, on, this, on the other side is a student from here who's now working at the University of Bergen in, in uh, Norway. And she's really interested in this, this area. Uh, and particularly in the, uh, the vitamin K seems to be involved in this process as well. So if we could manipulate that and help to turn the immune system back on again, we have a really important area to, to develop uh, as far as cancer is concerned. And the next steps uh, is a personal one for me because in, in 10 days' time, I'm going on, on leave uh, and we're going to be working in this lab in, in Norway on exactly this, this problem and trying to understand what is going on. And what is interesting here is that the group in Norway have got a, a new drug uh, which works exactly in this area. And it's a clinical trial at the moment and the results so far are, are promising. So this is a new uh, direction in a way of, of uh, finding out new ways, and you might notice among the talks that we've had so far, there are many different approaches uh, to the same problem. So that's what, we're going to, that's what I'm going to do, um, and then come, come back here towards the end of, uh, of the year. So in summary, this is a, uh, I think a picture, um, an impressionist picture dealing with um, pointillism, I suppose, uh, Seurat, I think, is the, is the artist. But the point here in this picture is that it's made up of a large number of tiny little coloured patches. But when you start to put them all together, you see a bigger picture. And I think this is what we feel with this culture system, that hundreds of patients have provided samples. We've collected data 
and we can collect more data using techniques like what Chris, Chris has talked about and gradually pick up, pick up a picture of, of what is really going on in human cancer at the body level. And just to finish, um, I'd like to thank particularly the cancer patients because there have been very many of them and they've all contributed to this, this picture and their contributions will carry on into the future. Uh, it's involved a large number of surgeons and pathologists, nurses, um, lots of people in the hospital, and as well as that, of course, all the people um, behind the toilet, as Lei Ming has mentioned, that are working in the cancer lab, and they've all contributed. So I'll stop there, and uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>
are scientifically proven uh, in um, research. Uh, so formal investigations such as uh, shown here, uh, which uh, investigated uh, uh, comparative att attitudes to breast cancer versus lung cancer, showing that uh, attitudes are, 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 are much more negative with concerning lung cancer uh, than breast cancer. So, but um, smoking habits uh, have changed greatly in New Zealand. So currently, 60% of our population are never smokers, and 25% are former smokers, and only 15% are current smokers. So if this room was representative of the New Zealand population, Perhaps the people in the middle between the two aisles would be the never smokers. Uh, the people over on the right here, on my right, uh, maybe they are the former smokers, so they no longer smoke, but have smoked um, uh, over 100 cigarettes in their lifetime. And the people on my left, left over in this aisle are the current smokers, who are struggling uh, with their dirty habit. So, but there's hope from uh, new uh, personalised approaches to lung cancer treatment. So, personalised uh, treatment involves uh, of lung cancer involves the identification of molecular drivers of lung cancer in each individual patient, and then using that information to individualise their therapy. It involves uh, no longer treating lung cancer as one disease, but um, a series of individual diseases and treating it accordingly. It involves collecting a specimen of the lung cancer prior to treatment and undertaking uh, an analysis of that tissue about its genetic makeup and protein expression uh, to understand, to try and identify the key uh, driver of, uh, of that cancer, particularly those drivers that can be disabled by a specific drug treatment. So within the last five years, these personalised lung cancer treatments have been introduced into the New Zealand healthcare system. And so with others, uh, I've been studying uh, uh, the uh, uptake of these new approaches and the impact they have had on uh, lung cancer in New Zealand. So uh, epidermal growth factor receptor uh, or EGFR mutation positive lung cancer was the first molecularly defined uh, subtype of lung cancer for which a personalised treatment became available in New Zealand. So between 2012 and 2015, Pharmac funded allotinib and gefitinib, which are EGFR inhibitors uh, for use for treating EGFR mutation positive lung cancer. And at the same time, the Ministry of Health published guidelines for the testing of lung cancer for EGFR mutations. Uh, and so we've been studying how well these, these new treatments have been impl implemented in our healthcare system and uh, found that uh, the uptake of testing has increased with time up to, to reach uh, 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 testing of 75% uh, of patients who are eligible for testing. And that's about the highest rate in the world. So we're doing pretty well on a, on a global scale. Also, we've been able to understand how prevalent EGFR mutation, lung cancer, uh, mutation positive lung cancer is in our population. So the prevalence in the tested uh, population is about 22%. So we would estimate that would be about 300 patients per year will present in New Zealand with this molecularly defined form of lung cancer. It has also challenged the stereotypes about lung cancer, so it's enabled us to look at the smoking status of patients presenting with lung cancer who are eligible for this testing. And so, which surprised us because most of the lung cancer patients are coming from the group over on our right, the former smokers. Um, that's the orange bar there. And then the next uh, most common, most patients come from the current smokers, but almost the same number of patients come from the middle group, the never smokers. 
So this has really challenged the stereotype that lung cancer is a problem of them, the smokers. It's really not in our uh, society. Um, and our research has also allowed us to study the impact that the introduction of this testing and targeted therapy has had on the survival of lung cancer patients, shown here. So um, comparing patients who were untested, who have relatively poor survival, compared to those who, have, who are tested and are found to have an EGFR mutation in their tumour and can be treated with one of these drugs. And even uh, uh, the patients who are tested and have, a, have no mutation have better survival compared to those who are not tested. So testing is associated with improved overall survival, irrespective of the result of that testing. So anaplastic lymphoma kinase uh, gene rearrangement positive or ALK positive uh, lung cancer is another molecularly defined uh, and highly treatable new lung cancer sub subtype. So this ALK positive lung cancer was discovered in Japan in 2007. Uh, and in 2015, the very first treatment for, specific treatment for ALK positive uh, lung cancer, crizotinib, was approved by MedSafe in this country, so for use in New Zealand. But here in 2018, we still have no pharmac subsidised treatments or national testing program for identifying patients for, with ALK positive lung cancer. But in our research, we have been trying to learn about the prevalence, the profile and outcomes of ALK positive lung cancer patients in our um, uh, population. So what is surprising, despite the lack of any pharmac subsidised treatments, clinicians are still doing a lot of testing. They think it's important to identify these patients. And so uh, over, three and a half, uh, over 350 patients have been tested in northern New Zealand for ALK uh, 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 positive lung cancer. So this has allowed us to estimate the prevalence, which is 8.5% of tested patients, which would mean in New Zealand there will be each year over 100 patients present with ALK-positive lung cancer. We've also been able to look at the profile of these patients, and it's surprising, again, uh, challenges the stereotypes. Uh, ALK-positive lung cancer patients are young, most are less than 60. Uh, most of them have never smoked and they're more likely to be Asian, Pacific or Maori than ALK negative, who are mostly Caucasian. And we've also been able to look at the survival outcomes of patients with um, ALK positive lung cancer in the absence of any pharmac subsidised treatments. So for patients who unfortunately have been unable to access any specific ALK treatment through a clinical trial or access scheme, their survival is as we would expect for lung cancer. So most patients uh, die within one year of diagnosis. Whereas for those that are able to access uh, ALK uh, specific treatments through clinical trials or access schemes, 90% are still alive two years after diagnosis. So a dramatic difference in uh, survival outcomes, meaning that once we get round to implementing ALK testing and targeted therapy in New Zealand, this will greatly improve survival, no doubt. So the final um, subtype of lung cancer I'd like to briefly talk about is that it's defined molecularly uh, by its strong expression of a protein called pdl one uh, and it is highly sensitive to uh, immunotherapy with Keytruda. So this is personalised immunotherapy for lung cancer. And programmed cell death ligand 1 is expressed on tumour cells and helps the tumour cells resist immune attack. But it's very variably expressed between different patients. So some patients have tumours that have very little expression. Other patients have uh, tumours that have a lot of expression of this pdl one And what we know from clinical trials elsewhere is if you select lung cancer patients with very high expression, then... Uh, you're selecting a group of patients that benefit a lot from Keytruda treatment. And this is a, a clinical trial of Keytruda in pdl one strongly overexpressing lung cancer. And in this trial, uh, Keytruda more than doubles survival, has less side effects, but unfortunately is more expensive. 
Currently, we have no local data on the prevalence or profile of PDL1 strongly expressing lung cancer in New Zealand, and we have no testing guidelines or state subsidised treatment. So, um, I'd like to finish by um, urging you to support um, these strong advocates of lung cancer prevention and treatment. So, firstly, uh, the Lung Foundation, who are a new group and are doing important work advocating to uh, the government and others for better access for lung cancer patients to treatment and care. Recently, the Lung Cancer Foundation uh, approached the uh, health ministry officials about the parlour state of uh, lung cancer treatments in New Zealand. And those health uh, ministry officials um, then transferred the, health, uh, the Lung Foundation onto the Minister of Tobacco. So, this, so the problem with attitudes to lung cancer go right to the top. So it's perceived in our government as a tax issue rather than a health care issue. Um, and also the Cancer Society who have and continue to do really important work in striving towards a smoke-free New Zealand. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for a wonderful talk. Um, any, any questions from the floor? Just one quick question. Is why is it such a large number of non-smokers who end up in lung It's because... Um, Sorry, could you repeat the question? Why uh, the, question was, the question was why do such a large number of uh, lung cancer patients, well, patient, people get lung cancer uh, and are not smokers? Uh, it's... It's because um, there's a significant uh, proportion of the total amount of lung cancer that is not related to smoking. Uh, the, these are the forms of lung cancer that we now recognise have specific molecular drivers like EGFR or ELK, and uh, smoking does not play a role in the cause of those uh, types of cancer. These will become increasingly important because uh, smoking will eventually die out from our society and that means that the lung cancer burden will, and former smokers will eventually uh, disappear from our society and that means that the lung cancer burden will be from never smokers. One more question. Right. The question is is small cell lung cancer a subset of lung cancer as you're describing this evening, or is it a separate cancer? Uh, it's small a, cell. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a sub subtype of lung cancer overall. Uh, it probably accounts for ten to fifteen percent of all lung cancer. It is becoming less common as uh, smoking becomes less prevalent, uh, and in in our uh, society. Why is it in uh, well, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think we know. Thank you, Mark. Well answered. Uh, there's always questions that we can't answer. Uh, so, on that note, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Professor Marin Gott. Professor Gott is. Uh, has had 20 years of experience in conducting research within the older population and with interest in developing models of palliative care and end-of-life care. Uh, Merrin is a director of the TRI Palliative Care and End-of-Life Research uh, Group and it conducts research in a multidisciplinary bicultural setting uh, using social, creative social research methods to inform practice and policy. Uh, Marin, we're very much looking forward to a, a talk which will be quite a different switch from what we've been talking about, but uh, uh, welcome to the podium. Thank you very much. Well, tēnā koutou tātou katoa. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's great to have this opportunity to tell you a little bit about the work of the TRI Palliative Care Research Group. Um, and it's late and I'm hungry, so rest assured I'm not going to take up too much of your time. And I'm also going to talk about something that we all know something about, and that's caregiving. 
So Rosalind Carter, former first lady, and who's, she's now a carer activist, says there's only four types of people in this world. Those who've been carers, those who are caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who need caregivers. So essentially, we all have a vested interest to get this right. And I want to talk about caregiving within a particular context. Um, and that context is palliative care. Because despite the sterling efforts of my colleagues, I've got bad news for you, and the mortality rate is still 100%. So we still um, do need um, palliative approaches to care. And this is an approach to care um, for anyone with a life-limiting illness. Um, so our work includes cancer, but it's not exclusive to cancer. Um, and we also know that palliative care can actually um, not only improve quality of life, but it can also extend life. And that was a trial um, done with people with lung cancer in the States. Um, and critical to the discussion that we're having today, it can also significantly increase quality of life for caregivers. Um, and I should say that in New Zealand, you can either receive palliative care through a specialist service, so about a third of people will, will receive it that way, or via your usual care provider, um, very often your GP. Just another point of context, these are figures produced by a member of my group, Heather McLeod, for the Ministry of Health, looking at need for palliative care. And the take-home message is that within the next 35 years, the need for palliative care is going to almost double. Um, and this is huge, and within the context of what I think we're euphemistically calling a constrained health system, it means that more and more work is going to be put onto family caregivers, and the nature of this work is becoming much more complex. So we know that being a caregiver can bring benefits, and I want us to remember that, but I also want to talk a little bit about the costs it can bring. And those can be physical, psychological, social. Um, and one I particularly wanted to mention is financial, because it's something we don't really talk very much about. Um, but I'm really keen to further explore the financial costs of caregiving, because unless we know those, the economic analyses that we conduct um, actually exclude all the costs that are incurred by caregivers. So we say, well, you know, we can reduce hospitalizations and this saves the health system money. But what those sorts of analyses don't recognize is actually that a lot of money is being put on to families. And so we explored this um, within the context of, of Auckland. And I just wanted to tell you one story because um, I think our work makes us social activists and makes us want to create change. Um, and this is one of those stories that stays with you. And this is two sisters we spoke to um, whose mother was dying in Auckland Hospital. And they couldn't actually both sit with her at the same time because they couldn't afford the parking. So, it, you know, it's really shocking that these are the sorts of situations that people are living with. And as I said, it's these sort of stories that um, keep us going and motivated in our work to create change. What else do we know? Well, we know that family caregivers spend approximately 70 hours a week caring in the last three months of someone's life. So it's a huge amount of work. Um, however, um, they often struggle to access the supports and information they need. And I'm sure those of you here who have been caregivers um, will, will find some resonance with this. And particularly um, with the fact that caregivers are having to navigate a really fragmented health and social care system. Um, and we talk a lot about professional care navigators, um, but often with a lack of recognition that families are actually often out there doing this work already, um, but they often feel unsupported by health professionals and health systems, which are so siloed. Our health system is so siloed. And it's family caregivers that are often there trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together. But I didn't want to send you out into this cold, dark night feeling a bit depressed about the state of things. I wanted to finish by saying a little bit about what our research is doing to make a difference. So firstly, um, our research has been critical to informing new policy directions by the Ministry of Health. Um, so there was a new um, palliative care action plan announced last year. And for the first time, there's a really significant focus upon family caregivers. It's one of the five priority areas. And our work's been really instrumental in underpinning um, that shift in focus. But we are not naive enough to think that policy in itself creates significant change. There's, there wasn't any um, targeted money put against this policy. Um, but we, so we also work um, a lot in partnership with lots of different service providers. There's lots of different people working in this space. So we work with DHBs. We work with the aged care sector. It's a really big um, group for us. We work with communities. And we work with NGOs as well. 
And just to mention one project, we're currently working with colleagues at ADHB, um, and they recognise that the one area of patient experience they don't know anything about at the moment is what's happening at the end of life. So we piloted a questionnaire that's being rolled out now across ADHB. We've got over 600 family carers who've, who've completed that, and that's um, for anyone who's had a contact with ADHB in their last year of life. Um, and what's looking really positive is that ADHB are keen to pick this up um, as a routine service improvement measure. So for the first time, we'll actually have experiential data from the people who are most affected to actually inform policy and service development. And already there's some really interesting stuff coming through, um, and the Palliative Care Governance Group are looking at how those changes can start to be made. Education and training, we're in university, so all our research is directly feeding into education and training within the School of Nursing. We have palliative care as a thread that runs throughout all our curricula. We also have specialist um, programmes. Um, and we also feed into public debate. And to do this, um, we're very aware that research can sometimes be a bit dry and boring, so we look at creative ways of getting our research out there. So, for example, our last HRC project, we actually worked with colleagues at the Faculty of Arts and we made a film. So we had um, actors talking to the narratives that, that people were telling us, the stories they were telling us. And this is being used as a resource for training GPs, for example. Um, and it's also being used within communities to have conversations. So lots of the issues that we find out about actually um, don't, create, don't require a huge amount of resource to fix. Um, and one thing that we're trying to do all the time is to look at where we can actually do something that will make a big difference, um, but there's not huge amounts of money in this space, so you know, what can we do with not very much? So we're starting to create a lot more resources for caregivers. So for example, together with undergrad nursing students, um, my colleague um, Michael Boyd has just created a resource for people um, around choosing an aged care facility. So aged care facilities are actually the most significant providers of palliative care in New Zealand at the moment, particularly if you're a woman. Um, so we're really looking at how we can make palliative care better in those settings. Um, and these sorts of resources, you know, the sorts of things to look at when you might want to choose a facility are the sorts of things people have been telling us that they want to, to receive. And then finally, but probably most importantly, um, we're working alongside caregivers and alongside communities to help them identify what supports they want um, and what um, can be put in place from their point of view. So for example, um, the group on the right of your slide, um, they're community collaborators in Komatua from a new project led by my colleague Tess Moika Maxwell, which is funded by the HRC. And that's looking at how Māori end-of-life care practices um, can be gathered, that information can be gathered, um, because this was something our Komatua felt was being lost. Um, and it's going to be used to create a digital resource so whānau can, can access in that information when they need it. Um, we also supported um, this, this lady here, Ros Kappa, who's an amazing um, activist. And she wrote the first um, practical guide to caregiving that was written actually by an ex-caregiver. And then finally at the bottom, we worked with the Pacific community. Um, and this is why it really pays to actually ask people what they want. Because I think we went in thinking, oh, well, they probably want some sort of information leaflets or maybe some educational sessions. Um, but what they actually wanted, and this was a group of older female caregivers, was to create a music video. So they actually um, got a local rap group to create a music video. Um, and if I had time, I'd play it for you, but I don't. But it's fantastic. And I never thought that in my research career I'd produce a music video. But <laughs> it's probably the most exciting thing I have ever created in my research. Um, but what's great is it's being used within Pacific communities, within churches, to actually spark a debate about the sorts of support that caregivers need. So that is all I wanted to, to tell you tonight. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the rest of my group. There's about 12 to 15 of us. We're a very multidisciplinary team. Um, and also all our research participants, because um, you know, we speak to people at what is often not a very easy time of their lives. Um, but I think, as Bruce said earlier, people really want to give back and they really want to tell their stories. But we're very grateful to them for doing that. And thank you for your time this evening. <laughs> Questions. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, kia ora fana. I just wanted to ask everyone, um, what is the current time lag between the end of clinical trials when something is available and when members of the public who have cancer <laughs> or looking for it can expect to find it? It's the first part. Is there an average length at the moment, or does it vary widely? Um, it's, I, I guess I would say five years. Okay. But, I guess I ask that because we've got a grand, grandson who had leukaemia, but the gap between the knowledge, <coughs> knowledge that Judy and I as university staff members can access and the, and the clinicians who are treating them and the other people working with them is so big that we found ourselves resourcing and supporting and arguing and fighting and so we would like better information service available to people and we'd like that funded actually as a research project how to provide better information services to people about what's happening in cancer it's wonderful to be here tonight and to hear this it, what's happening but for lots of us this is a one-off yeah so if you could do anything about that it would be great Did you pay for the parking? <laughs> no, I wish we could have done, but actually this was retrospectively, so they were telling us this story. Um, but yeah, I've been thinking about creative ways to do something about that. That's on my radar, so if anyone's got any ideas. Housing? Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. That's fantastic. I'd love to hear more. So um, in terms of access to healthcare, and in this case, palliative care, there tends to um, be a huge like social economic basis to um, bias and basis to it. Um, as, as you said in the news article about the two sisters who had to sleep in the car. So um, I was curious as to what you and your group or any other groups uh, doing to like work on um, reducing this inequality between, um, say, um, like people of different like social economic classes or other like inequities in New Zealand. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So one of um, the big focuses of our research group is equity. So um, the way we do that is firstly by primarily concentrating on people who don't get access to specialist palliative care because we know that they have a much more difficult time. Um, and we also work really closely with different um, cultural groups to look at specific needs. And we're always very sensitive to issues around um, economics. And we're just about to write an HRC grant, which is going to look at, hopefully, probably won't get funded, but fingers crossed, um, but would look at palliative care provision in um, economically deprived communities using an assets-based approach. So looking at kind of what assets they draw on and then from their point of view what the challenges are. Because I think that's always the key is to, to look at the strengths um, and to look at what people on the ground really want rather than guessing. But thank you, it's a good question. Perhaps we'll have one more question. Um, a lot of these people will be older and actually we, the system probably doesn't want us living longer because, <laughs> you know, so I'm just wondering how it kind of balances out, how you, well, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think so. Um, I mean, you're right. So the, the biggest growth in palliative care need is for people over 85 and it's for people with complex comorbidity. Um, so what we really need to do is actually to understand a bit more about um, the sorts of care people need in that situation because our models of palliative care are based on younger people with cancer. So we need to, for example, as we are looking at how to improve palliative care and aged care because that's a huge setting for palliative care. As I said, if you're a woman over, and over 65, you've got a more than 50% chance of dying while you live in age residential care. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of tonight's program, and um, I just wonder if I could invite all our speakers to just stand up uh, for another round of applause, please.
Um, I'm very conscious of time, so I thought, but I was given the challenge to try and sum up tonight in two minutes, so I'll have a go at that, um, see, see what we can do, because tonight really was a bit of a smorgasbord, a sort of a degustation menu of incredible science. Um, Bill started off with a very uplifting uh, message around the technology behind some very exciting new drugs that are coming our way. And I think the, very, uh, the, the great signal there that you know, cancer survival rates have more than doubled since the 1970s. It still shows us we have a long way to go, but I think uh, we get a sense that we are making great progress each and every year. Um, Lei Ming then put the frighteners on us, talking about uh, killer T cells, serial killer cells, and then weapons of mass destruction. Um, but when you think about the context of all of that, it sort of makes great sense in how she detailed how our own immune system can be channeled to fight our own cancer. Um, Chris was very much the modernist. Um, he used the phrase disruptive technology um, and it talked about playing chess with tumours, um, how uh, science can, and understanding the genome, uh, the genomes in tumours can outflank and outsmart them um, and we can get our targeted medicine. Um, then there was Bruce, and, and what we didn't know about Bruce was Bruce uh, plays the cello. He's a very accomplished cello player, and his message was very much one of culture, growing uh, cell lines in culture, um, <laughs> and translating his labo uh, laboratory research into trials with, with patients. And uh, we learned that you need green fingers to do that work, so I thought that was good. Um, Mark's message was one of great compassion um, for those in our community with lung cancer who... Yes, it is true, are, are often stigmatised uh, 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 because they have lung cancer and we need to be very compassionate. And I think Mark illustrated that no two cancers uh, are, are exactly the same and we can get very much personal, if we understand them better, we can get very much more effective and personalised medicine. And then I think Marin finished things off very nicely with a, with, a, with a refreshing, dare I say it, a very caring approach to the subject that we don't really like to think um, very much about, which is you know, palliative care, end of life care, what happens to us in that la last stage. And this is really, really important work um, because I think, as you say, we'll all be caregivers and ca needers of caregivers at some stage along. So look, thank you again for our speakers. I thought it was a, a fantastic event. It's great to get these small tastes of what's going on. I know our speakers will be staying around, so I'm sure please feel free to interact with them. You'll have other questions, um, and I'm sure they'll be uh, uh, only too happy to talk to you after the event in the foyer. And um, just to, as a final word for me, uh, a commercial for the next uh, um, uh, event that we're having here, which is on July the 19th. And uh, Maren, you'll be very pleased that this is called Living Longer, um, a social revolution. So that's at 7 o'clock, July the 19th. Uh, I believe it's in the same place. So um, we'd love to see as many of you as possible coming along to that. And please spread the word about these events. They're fantastic events, and the more people that can attend, the better. So thank you very much for coming along, and a safe journey. Home.